I want to talk to you for a few minutes from the subject of because of God. I want to talk about something that happened because of God. Genesis 49, verse 26. The blessings of your father are greater than the blessings of the oldest mountains and the riches of the ancient hills. May these blessings rest on the head of Joseph, on the crown of the prince among his brethren or his brothers. The blessings of your father are greater than the blessings of the oldest mountains and the riches of the ancient hills. Let's let that rain, let that soak as rain right now into your head and into your heart to prepare you for where we're headed. This passage comes from the area there in uh, Genesis 49 where that Jacob is about to pass away. And he has gathered unto himself his sons and he's giving them his blessings. The part that I read to you is a portion from the blessing that he gives to his son Joseph. Uh, if you're familiar with the story of Joseph, how many people in the room are pretty familiar with the story of Joseph? Raise your hand. You say, I think I know the story of Joseph. And, and, and this is not a trick question. You, I'm, I'm not trying to trick you and say, well, you're dumber than what you thought. I'm saying, you know the story of Joseph. Raise your hand. If you're familiar with the story of Joseph, then you're going to find this blessing interesting because uh, in my mind, at least, it is a well-deserved blessing for a long, hard-lived life that he had suffered. Even at this early age where he was at the point of receiving this blessing, he had lived a long, hard life. And after everything he'd been through, if you're like me, you find yourself thinking these thoughts. Finally, something good for poor Joseph. Finally. I'm going to try to explain what I mean by that. So I go back. I won't, obviously, I can't spend a lot of time on this because I'm going somewhere. I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on this foundation for you to understand a little bit about the story. As a boy, Joseph had had big dreams. You know that. He'd tried to share those dreams with the people that were closest to him, probably because he hoped that they would help him process those dreams. Am I right? But how did they receive it? They saw him as arrogant. They, they could not imagine him being the second youngest of all the children. They could not imagine him someday being their boss. Any of you older siblings could say that about your baby brothers and sisters. In this case, Joseph has dreams, and all the dreams that he shares are dreams where it ends up looking like that they are some way, in some point, subservient to him. They're all older, they're bigger, they're stronger, they're more experienced, they, they think they have more wisdom. They are, er, they are upset and they are uh, angered at the fact that he, in his arrogant state, has these dreams of all of them apparently bowing down to him. But he shares the dreams with them in hopes, because these are the people that are closest to him. He shares the dreams with them in hopes that maybe they can help him process it. Or maybe they can, they can add something to it or give him some kind of instruction. But they despised him for his dreams. People will do that to you too. First thing I want to share with you real quick. This is not a point on the screen, but just you might want to make a note. Be careful who you share your dreams with. <laughs> Be careful who you share your dreams with. The right people will celebrate with you. They'll even help you try to achieve them. You tell your dreams to the wrong people, they'll try to sabotage them. They'll try to stamp them out due to jealousy and smallness. How many people in the room has got big dreams? Be careful who you share your dreams with. Amen? So his dad favored him. And he gave him, y'all remember the story about the coat of many colors. He gave him a coat of many colors with long sleeves. And it infuriates them even more so. Now they want to get rid of him. There came a day where dad sent him to his sons. The rest of the sons were out in the field watching the flocks. And he says, Joseph, go check on your brother. See what's up. Come back. Tell me what's happening. They're out there shepherding the sheep. And they see him coming and they devise a cruel plan. Look at Genesis chapter 37. You want to flip back? You can. I don't read to you a lot, but I'm going to read this to you. Verses 19 through 28. They said, this is God's word. They said to each other, look, here comes that master dreamer. Let's kill him. Let's throw him into one of the cisterns or let's throw him into a deep pit. And let's say that a wild animal has eaten him. 
And then we'll see what happens to his dreams. Well, when Reuben heard this, Reuben was older brother. He tried to save Joseph from the plot. He said, let's not kill him. Let's not have any bloodshed. Let's put him in that, into that cistern that's out in the desert. But don't hurt him because Reuben was thinking about how that later on he would come back and rescue him. When the rest were gone, he'd come back and get him out of the pit and bring him back to his father. So when Joseph reached his brothers, they stripped him of his special robe with the long sleeves. And they took him and they put him in the empty cistern. It had no water in it. And they sat down to eat and they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. And their camels were carrying the materials for cosmetics and medicine and embalming. They're on their way to take them to Egypt. And Judah asked his brothers, what are we going to gain by killing our brother and covering up his death? Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let's not hurt him because he's our brother. How about that logic? He's my brother. We can't kill him. We can sell him. He's our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. And as the Midianite merchants were passing by, the brothers pulled him out of the pit. And they sold him to the Ishmaelites for eight ounces of silver. And the Ishmaelites took him to Egypt. This is the start of a very difficult 13 years for Joseph. This is the, very, the beginning of what's going to be really tough for him. If you look at the story, here's what you find out. He's been sold into slavery by his own family. Very shortly, he's going to be falsely accused of attempted rape. He's going to spend 13 years in a prison, completely innocent. He's going to be forgotten by a fellow prisoner who could have helped him get out. And then when he finally gets released, he's going to be burdened with saving the world. Basically from a massive famine. People look at the story of Joseph and they're like, oh, how cool. He got to be Number two in charge of a whole country. They tried to do him wrong and look what he ended up being. Man, that, that's just a great story for motivation. But that's not where I'm going. I want you to understand that his life was not normal. It wasn't like how many in this room are 17 years old? 15, 16, 17. This is his life. And it's not a happy young adult life. His, his memories are not fond. His experience are not fun. They're not filled with adventure. He didn't get to hang around with his buddies. He didn't get to go to prom. He didn't get to date. He's in prison from the time he's 17 until he's 30 for something he didn't do. And he's just rotting there for no seeming reason. He went from being an innocent kid to being a 13-year prison vet. Now in charge of a nation. That's not a normal life. His was not a normal calling. The second thing I want to tell you. It's not going to be on the screen. The more powerful your calling. The more strenuous your preparation. Did you get that? The more powerful your calling. The more strenuous your preparation. So those of you that say. Man my, my life has been rough. My life has been rough. I've been through it. Understand that God has something powerful and special for your life. My question, and when I'm reading all this, I'm thinking to myself, how many, how many times did it torment his mind over those years, everything he'd lost? Think about it. 17, 18, 19, 20. Anybody remember back being 21, 22, 23, 24, 25? Everything that happened in your life from my time of 17 to, to, uh, to 30, man, Graduated high school, graduated college, met Deb, got married, had two kids, went into ministry. I mean, everything that happens for a person in those years have been stripped away from him for no reason. How much did that torment his mind? His life that's being wasted, his dreams that, that he'd been given, that now they seemed absolutely impossible. Am I right? He had those dreams. He tried to process them. People made fun of him. And now he's in prison and he's thinking, was I crazy? There's no way that these things could, there's no way that these things could ever happen. There's no way that these dreams could ever possibly come to pass. How do you become the leader of your family when you're in prison in another country? And none of this made any sense to him. But notice this, it didn't change him. It didn't make sense, but it didn't change him. It didn't change his character, it just strengthened it. 
It didn't change his faith. It just strengthened it. It didn't change his personality or his giftedness. It just strengthened those things. But it must have plagued him. Why? Because he's wondering, what is all of this because of? What is all of this because of? What did I do? How many of you ever, ever asked yourself that question? You had a difficult life and you look back on it and you say, what did I do? This is, I, I've heard people say, you get, you, know, you get what you have coming. I must have done something to bring this on myself. What did I do to deserve all this? I'm going to point out a couple things about this that should have been the mindset and the character of Joseph, but they weren't. They would have been for any other person, any other lesser person of faith. But in Joseph's life, the facts did not destroy him. So here he is. He's in prison. There's no hope of a change, but here are the facts of his life. Get out your pen, your paper, get ready to write these things down. Here are the facts of his life. Now, there's a whole lot more than these, but these are the three that the Lord has shown me over this last week. Number one, what's going on in Joseph's mind? Jerry, he's spending 13 years in prison. He's got plenty of time to think. Now, he's, 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 he's rising up, cream of the crop will rise up no matter where it is. I mean, he's rising up in the prison, and he's already being given responsibility. He's being prepared for what's coming later, even while he's in prison. But he's still got time to think. He still has time to be Joseph. He still has time to feel. He still has time to miss. So the very first thing that I found as I was studying that this week is the fact of his life, number one, was he was devalued. He was devalued. I'm going to show you what I mean by that. The scripture said he was sold for eight ounces of silver. Look at there, Genesis 37, 28. As the Midianite merchants were passing by, the brothers pulled him out of the cistern. They sold him this life for eight ounces of silver. You know what the going rate was? 12 ounces of silver. Where'd you get that, Pastor? Exodus chapter 21, 32. If a bull gores a male or female slave, an owner must pay 12 ounces of silver to the slave's master, and the bull must be stoned. Where are you going with that? I'm noticing that in the scripture, he's 17 years old. The scripture tells us he's in good health. He's strong. He's handsome. He's, he's got to be. I mean, the, the scripture even, it even uses the word, he was handsome and well built. Which is why Potiphar's wife wouldn't leave him alone. <laughs> Potiphar immediately sees him when the Midianites get there and he sees value. He buys him. He sees value in this guy. But his own family... Saw no value in him. He wasn't even worth the price of a common slave. I thought how relevant that was to a lot of our lives. How that when you were growing up, the people that you thought should have loved you and protected you and promoted you and helped you. Instead, they spent years calling you stupid and worthless and telling you that you were in the way. Don't raise your hand. I don't need to know who I'm talking to. I know I'm talking to you. The people that you looked up to, the people that you respected, the people that were supposed to be put in your life to love you and help you and guide you did more to destroy you they challenged and diminished your dreams. Why would people in your life do that to you? You've asked yourself that for years. It's because they couldn't stand for you to be better than them. Couldn't stand for you to be more than them. They had to make you less. Because as small as they were, they had to be greater. They didn't see the value in you. That other strangers could see. That's why some of you have spent your life saying, wow, I, you know, my mom and dad or, or my uncle or my aunt or whoever it was, they just devalued me all the time. But at school, they would tell me, yeah, you're smart. I mean, you can make, and I just don't understand that. At school, they saw, they, they saw something in me. I don't get it. And it scarred you. Until now, even today, you struggle under the weight of those abusive years. When we're devalued by the people that we love and trust the most, it scars us the worst. And it scars us for life. 
Joseph was devalued. Secondly, he was ignored. How do you know that, Pastor? I take you to Genesis 42, verse 21, modern King James Version. This is now them talking about years later. Years later, they they didn't have this conscience when they threw him in the pit. But years after all this has happened, and now he's in charge, and now they're coming to him for help, they're starting to realize something that they never acknowledged before. Look at 42, verse 21. And the brothers said to one another, We are truly guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he begged us, and we would not hear. We saw the anguish of his soul. And we ignored it. And it takes me back to that day perhaps when he approaches his brothers and instead of receiving a welcome and instead of embracing, they grab him immediately and treat him as if he was a criminal and they begin to strip his clothes off and they throw him in a pit. Anybody ever been thrown in a pit? I can probably say I'm probably the only one in the room that's ever that can really relate to this story. This really happened to me when I was seven years old out in Southern California. The church had dug a pit, a foundation for the new church sign. And it was probably about four feet deep. And the big boys caught me and threw me in the pit. The teenagers, I guess I tormented them to the point they couldn't take it anymore. I don't know. They were probably trying to sneak around with my sisters, and I probably was in the way, you know. So they threw me in a pit, Rev, and they covered it with a piece of plywood. And it was nighttime. And I was seven. And I stayed in there for a little while. (laughs) And some of you mamas are getting mad right now Somebody did that to my boy, my baby I can relate To just temporarily They couldn't leave me forever Because my sisters found out where I was Somebody's going to come and get me I knew on the outside There were people there that loved me And my own dad If it it wasn't going to happen to my dad My mama wouldn't going to allow this If she would have known I wouldn't be in a pit But for a temporary season, I was in a pit. And I was covered up. And I couldn't get out. And it was dark. And it was scary. And I was seven years old. I can only imagine when Joseph sized up this circumstance. They're dragging him over to the opening of a pit that he can see down in. And he's begging them. He's pleading with them. Please, guys, please, no, don't throw, don't throw me in there. What have I ever done? I mean, everything you can imagine is spilling out. They're remembering it now in the scripture. All those years later, they're saying, we're guilty of this. He was anguished in his soul, and we ignored him. He was distressed to his very core. He pleaded with us. He begged us. And we threw him in the pit anyway. How many times did you cry in hopes that a Savior would come to your rescue and they never showed up? Don't raise your hand. It hurts for you to remember those wounds, I know, but hang on. Number three, he was grieved. Chapter 45, verse 1 and 2, God's word, Joseph, this is now after the brothers have come back and all these things have happened. He's, been in, he's out of prison. He's, uh, he's been stocking up uh, supplies. Brothers are starving back in their homeland. They, they've come over here to, to, the, to this land now to try to get some help and to get some food. And they don't know who Joseph is. And Joseph has now been in charge. And now Joseph is actually seeing the dream come to pass because his brothers are bowing down in front of him, begging him for food. And he's like, okay, all this is starting to make sense. But... Hang on. In verse 45, verse 1 and 2, chapter 45, verse 1 and 2, here's what happens. After all of that, Joseph could no longer control his emotions in front of everyone who was standing around him. And so he cried out, have everybody leave me. 
No one else was there when Joseph told his brothers who he was. He cried so loudly that the Egyptians heard him. And Pharaoh's household heard about it. He's finally reached a point in his life after all those years that he can release the grief that's been welled up in his soul for 13 years. This is an unbridled expression of grief that he's being freed from. He couldn't hold it any longer and he didn't have to. It's time to let it out. Today was the day to let it out. Verse 40, verse 15, verse four, uh, chapter 45. This, is, this part right here, guys, is going to blow, blow your mind. This is unbelievable. And he kissed all his brothers and he wept upon them. And afterwards, his brothers talked with him. I'm going to show you something here. You may never thought about. They've changed. He's changed. But it's still not yet understood at this point by them, the healing that is happening. I want you to notice something about this circumstance. Joseph initiates the moment. You still there? Wave at me if you're still there. I want to make sure you're listening to this. Now, who should have been asking for forgiveness? Who should have been blubbering and crying and saying, we're so sorry that we did this to you? Who should have been doing that? Because what had Joseph done? I'm going to show you something. They didn't because they couldn't because they were in no position to forgive. Joseph had to initiate the process. He chose to kiss those who had so blatantly betrayed him. He chose to weep on their shoulders and afterwards they were released to reciprocate. The strained relationship could now be rectified. But it had to start with the one who had been harmed the most. They weren't free to apologize. Until the one who had been harmed was willing to forgive. It's quiet in here today. That's hard to hear, and it's even harder to do. Look at this. Joseph explains to them what it's all about, why all this happened, what their, what their role in God's plan had entailed. And then his brother Judah unknowingly explains God's love for all of us when he tells Joseph about, about the dad's love for his other son, Benjamin, because Joseph says, bring Benjamin here. And, 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 and Judah's like, we can't do that. We can't do that. He already thinks you're dead. We can't do that. Look at verse uh, 30 and 44. Judah says, our father's life. Oh, I want you to hear this. Our father's life is wrapped up with the boy's life. That one will preach all by itself. Our father's love is wrapped up with your life. You're his son. You're his daughter. He wants the best for you. He hates it when you suffer as any good parent would. He's got your best at interest. But he has had to allow your life to go where your life went. And that is what's so difficult for you to understand. And as a parent, and all of you that are parents wave at me. As a parent, we know how difficult it is to let our children go their own journey. When we know, we know what that's going to do. We know where that's going to end. Sometimes one of the hardest things for a parent is to just act stupid. And to let people make their own decisions. Because it's in that that they learn, that they couldn't learn, they wouldn't learn, they weren't listening to learn. So here's God's hands off on Joseph's life, loving him from a distance, always there with him in his heart, always present. God, where are you at? I'm in a pit. I'm with you. I'm with you. It's dark, but I'm with you. Where are you at? I'm in prison. I'm with you. I, I know. I'm innocent. I know you're innocent. I'm with you. I'm with you. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on. However hard or however painful or however dysfunctional 
your life has seemed, God has always been there with you. He's always been with you, for you, through you. He's bringing everything in your life to a climactic point. And it might not be here yet. That time might not. But trust me, it's going to appear when the time's right. And here's Joseph. He talks to his brothers at this point. Look at chapter 45, verse 8 and 9. Oh, here we go, guys. Are you ready for this? He says, it wasn't you who sent me here, but God. Nah, some of you are like, no, 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 no. What happened to me? No, no, no. I'm not going there with you, Pastor. It wasn't you who sent me here, but God. He's made me like a father to Pharaoh and lord over his entire household and ruler of Egypt. Hurry back to my father and say to them, this is what your son Joseph says. God's made me lord of Egypt. Come here to me right away. Everybody say with me, it was God. It was God. How could what happened to you? have anything to do with God you've learned how to separate that and say well God is good and God is love and he's over here and everything that happened to me wasn't his fault but he was just I was just on my own but but now that we're together no 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 I'm telling you God has been a part of your life at every moment in every juncture not always happy with what's happening not always okay with seeing you suffer but always okay with knowing what the end was going to be And Joseph's dad and his family all come to Egypt where they're saved. And and Joseph sees his dreams just like he prophesied. Look at Genesis 46, 29. Joseph gets word. You ready for this? Everybody still awake? Joseph gets word that his dad is on his way. He hadn't seen his dad. He loved his dad. His dad and him were always tight. He hadn't seen his dad in all these years. He gets word dad's on his way. I feel anointing right here. You know how I am. I start crying. Hang on a minute. Joseph prepared his chariot, and he went to meet his father, Israel. And as soon as he saw his father... He threw his arms around him and he cried on his shoulder a long time. Let's talk for a minute about what happens when you get back to your father. And all of a sudden, the people who thought that they were devalued, when they get back to their father, they realize how much value that they always had had. When they get back to their father, those who couldn't get anybody to listen to them, they've been ignored all their life. But when they get back to their father, all of a sudden they have God's full attention. Those people who spent their life grieving, crying, worrying, in doubt and confusion and pain, when they get back to their father, all of a sudden their life makes sense and there's no grief, but he has replaced it with unspeakable joy that is full of glory. How could this happen? How can I go from being devalued and ignored and grieving to being... Being the person that is being exactly what God put me on this planet to be. It was because of God. As soon as he saw his father, he threw his arms around him and he cried on his shoulder for a long time. Can you imagine what that reunion was like? The father that thought the son was dead and now he gets to see him alive again. The son who thought he might not ever see his father again. And the only good memory of his family that he ever had. The brothers had betrayed him. They weren't good memories. But dad had always been a good memory. To put the two back together again. Can somebody say amen? To get the children back with the father. That's where we're whole. And now everything's come to pass and Israel knows. Israel being Jacob, he says, you know, my life's come to full circle. My son's alive. I've got to see him again. I'm ready now. I'm I'm prepared. I'm ready to go on. I'm ready to die and go on to heaven. And he calls his sons in to give them their blessings. And if you read the blessings, some of the blessings are good and some of them are not so good. Some of these boys, after all they had done, they didn't get a real good word from their father. But Joseph's isn't like some of theirs. Oh, my goodness. Look at chapter 49, verse 22. 
Jacob starts speaking to Joseph. Cody, here it comes. Joseph is a fruitful tree. A fruitful tree by a spring with branches climbing over a wall. Archers provoked him. They shot at him and they attacked him. But his bow stayed steady and his arms remained limber. Because of the help of the mighty one of Jacob. Because of the name of the shepherd, the rock of Israel. Because of the God of your father who helps you. Because of the almighty who gives you blessings from heavens above. And blessings from the deep springs below the ground. And blessings from the breast of the womb. The blessings of your father are greater than the blessings of the oldest mountains and the riches of the ancient hills. May these blessings rest on the head of Joseph. May May these blessings rest on the head of Rebecca. May these blessings rest on the head of Brent. May these blessings rest on the head of Connor. May these blessings rest on you today. On the crown of the prince among his brethren. I know that some of you have suffered some terrible things. Abuse, injury, neglect. You said we can really relate with what we're talking about today. Pastor, I spent my whole life with people devaluing me. I spent my whole life trying to be something because I was told by everybody else I would never amount to nothing. I spent my whole life trying to prove to somebody that I'm of value, that I'm of worth. I spent my whole life being ignored. They said, he's just a dumb kid. She's just a dumb kid. I spent my whole life grieving. Oh, I've been able to put up some pretty good walls. I learned how to tell jokes and be the funny guy. I learned how to act like none of it bothered me. Let me tell you just before I close, what is the difference between a scar and a scab? Are you ready? A scar represents a wound that has healed and is now simply a reminder of something that happened. But it's over. A scab is something that gets put over the wound. That lets us know the wound is still there down deep. It's still there. So you got two different kinds of people in the church. You got some that's got scars. Some of us have got a lot of scars. Some of us are just walking around with scabs. And we're trying to tell everybody that what we have are scars. But they're not scars. They're scabs. Because we never, we never, we may have been serving the Lord 20 years, but we never allowed the wound to get healed. We just kept it scabbed over. So we forgot about it. We let it go. We acted like it never happened. We didn't know how to explain it. We couldn't come to terms with it. We didn't know what to do with it. We didn't know who to talk to about it. We prayed about it, but we didn't know what else to do. So we're like, okay, I guess this is the way it's supposed to be. So I guess I'm just probably going to live with this the rest of my life. And God says, no, you're not going to live with this the rest of your life unless you choose to. The scab's going to become a scar. The scar's going to become a point of testimony. I was wounded at one time in my life. Here's the scar to prove it, but I got victory over that. I'm not hurt here anymore. I can talk about this. It don't bother me because I'm not hurt here anymore. If the thing that you have still hurts for you to remember, for you to talk about, if it still hurts, then it's not healed. I'm the world's worst, guys. If I get, you know, I go out and I, I go outside and get mosquito bit, and you know how it itches. I gotta scratch it, and I'll scratch it until stupidly, you know, I'll scratch it until it bleeds or something, you know, because I'm ready for it to be. When I was a little kid, I'd get poison ivy. I, I'm gonna be honest with y'all. I got some scars on my arms. I get poison ivy. I hated, I hated poison ivy. I would get it so bad. I would go into the sink and I, and listen, I would fill the water with Lysol. Put Lysol in the water. Put my arm down in it and take a pocket knife and cut the poison ivy off. And stick it under that so it would burn it off. I 
hated poison ivy. I'd rather have scars than poison ivy. I still hate poison ivy today. I still get it if I'm not careful. And I am careful. I know what it's like when I get a mosquito bite and I scratch it till it bleeds and the next day it makes a scab. And I'm that guy, if it's there, I just can't help it. I, it's there. I, can't, I just, it's there. I just kind of picked it off. Is anybody else like that? Like, I got, I, it, it's, it's there. I mean, it's this little bump on my leg. I can feel it. I'm like, uh, uh. And then it starts bleeding again. It starts bleeding. I'm like, oh, dead gummit, here we go. Now I got to wait for this. And then tomorrow I'm going to sit down for a minute and I'm going to look down and see that leg. And I'm like, uh, I'm going to pick it off. And then. Some of you folk have been living like that in church for years. You just haven't let it heal. Oh. I prayed for you today. I prayed that you would be here today. That God would put in this room the ones who needed to hear this word. Because something's about to happen in here that's going to freak some of y'all out real bad. In fact, I'm going to say it to you right now. If this is all you can take here in a minute, they're going to sing and you should leave. I'm just being straight. You know how I am. I'm being straight with you. I'm telling you. If you're going to freak out, you should leave. Because here in a minute, here in a minute, when the Holy Ghost hits this altar, there are going to be some people in here that are weeping and wailing so loud, they're going to give Joseph a run for his money when they said that the, 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 the Egyptians could hear him crying out loud. And, and if you hang around, you're about to see some big boys. And some strong ladies wailing and crying because what they're doing is they have come back to the Father. They've wrapped their arms around Him. They're letting go of all of that hurt and all that pain and all that feeling of being devalued and ignored and grieved. They're going to turn loose of all that this morning and they're going to get themselves a new scar. They're going to get rid of a scab and they're going to walk out of here without a scab and a scar instead. So if you don't want to see that, if you don't, if, if you say, if you say, I'm here today, Pastor, and I've enjoyed it, it's been good, it's been kind of weird, I've been kind of stretched already, I'm stretched enough, I, I think I've seen enough, then I'm, I'm cool, I love you, I'm not going to judge you when you leave. But for all the rest of you that hang around, you're about to see something. You're about to see the word of the Lord. You're about to see freedom and healing and the laying on of hands. And you're about to hear chains hit the ground for people that are saying, I don't want my scab no more. I want my scar. I don't want my scab no more, Alan. I want my scar. How many people I'm talking to? Get up right now. Get up. Who am I talking to? Get up. Hurry. Stand up. Stand up. Get down here. Come on. Get down here. Let's go. I don't want my scab no more. I want my scar. Come on. Come on down here. It's already happening. I told you it's already you can't get down here without feeling the Holy Ghost. Look at this. You walk down here and it's going to hit you. you might, some of you might not even make it down here. It's going to hit you. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Pour it out. Pour your heart out before Him. Turn loose of that. Release that. Who all wants to come? If you want to come, come on. Anybody wants to come, come on. Come on down. Come on down. Hurry up. Don't wait. Don't wait. Come on down. I was serious a minute ago. I was not manipulating when I said we're going to sing a song. And if you want to leave, you can leave. I'm not going to judge you. I'm serious. I'm serious about that. I'm not going to look negatively upon you. Because what's about to happen in here is getting ready to be really powerful. And I, I, I want everybody in this room that's here left, I want you to, I want us in one mind and one accord. And we're ready. Are you ready? We're about to do battle. We're about to do battle with the devil. We're about to win. We're going to win some victories. We're going to win some victories today. We're going to lose some chains today. We're going to get free in this house today. We're going to have that same freedom that we talked about. And we're going to have that again here today. We're not going to leave here the way we came in Jesus' name. We're leaving different. We're going to leave here different. Our wife and our husband are going to say, who is that? We're talking about people that have known Jesus a long time. But God's about to melt your heart. He's about to change your life. Come on, they're still coming. They're still coming. They're still coming. The Spirit of God is drawing people to this altar right now. There's the powerful anointing right here in this room. Some of you are here for the first time. You're a guest and you're like, I've never been here before. I don't know what's going on. 
but you're drawn. Listen to me. If you're a guest and you've not, you don't know what's going on, but you're interested, you're still here. Come on, get down here and watch this. If you're a guest, you don't have to go to church here to come be a part of this. You say, man, I, 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 I'm supposed to be. God sent me here for this today. I'm supposed to be here today. God put me in this room today. I'm supposed to hear this. If I'm talking to you, come on, get down here. Don't worry about anybody around you. Don't worry about what anybody else is saying or doing. Don't let this moment get past you. There are people right here in this, in this line. There are people in this line who experienced terrible abuse. The Holy Spirit, I know it I know it'd be easy for me to say, I mean, this is a natural, it'd be easy for me to say this. It's not like I'm some kind of a, a, a of a genius to know this. But I'm saying what I feel the Holy Spirit is saying to me. You'd be like, that's easy, that's like saying. You get hundreds of people together and you say, somebody in this room has a headache. We're like, yeah, like. 25% of them do, you know. That doesn't make you a genius to figure out 25 people in the room have a headache or, or somebody's finger hurts. I'm telling you something, though, that I'm feeling from the Holy Spirit right now. Some of you in this room, women and possibly even a man or two, are in this line because when you were young, you were raped. Some are in this line because your upbringing was so horrific. Your parents, regardless of whether they were well-meaning or not, damaged you terribly. They left scars. There's a man in this room. Who wouldn't, he was just a small kid. He wasn't even a teenager yet. His dad used to beat him. I'm not calling anybody out because I don't know who I'm talking about. I just feel it. But... But no, I'm not talking about whipping. I'm talking about beat him possibly with a belt on his back. I can see it. And you've gotten so hard. You've gotten so calloused. You've learned to be strong. You've learned to be tough. You've, long, you've learned to... to to scab that over but I'm telling you it's not a scar it's a scab you still have a hard time having a relationship with your father and it's in some ways damaging your relationship with your father I don't know who I'm talking to but if that's you and you want and you want God to touch you today I, I feel an anointing to lay hands on you and pray for you whoever that man is right now who am I talking to Am I, am I talking to anybody? If I'm talking to you, I want you to come down real quick. It's, I'm, I won't belabor this very long because I'm going to move on. But I actually can see, I can see a little boy standing, looking in a mirror backwards at bruises on his back left from the buckle of a belt. I know it'd be hard for you right now to admit that or to ever uh, you don't want to come to terms with that perhaps but I'm saying that to that man whoever he is God is speaking a word to me he's, he, he's telling me I would love to pray for you I don't know who I'm talking to whoever it is come, come down here come down here if you want me to if you want me to pray if you don't I can't help it but I mean, I, I, Rev, if I hear, sometimes I hear the Lord and I can physically see, I can see this damage that was done. 
If you want even more specificity, it started when you were 12 years old. Wasn't it? 12 years old when it started. I'm not going to keep going. But that wasn't the extent of it at either. There were other things. And you have been damaged for a long, long time. Amen. I'd love to pray with you, but I'm not going to keep going. Lord, you have brought us to this place. I know, I sense what you're about to do. Here in a moment, God, wails, cries are going to go up. But as they go up, God, I see you opening the windows of heaven and pouring out love and refreshing and healing and blessing. It's about to happen. It's about to happen. It's about to happen. It's about to happen. And so I thank you right now, Lord, for what you're about to do. I want the team, if they would, to lead us. And I'm just going to come down and pray with y'all. But here in a minute, here in a minute, I feel like that that's going to happen. I feel like the, those windows, those, that it's like a dam that's about to burst. You feel that? It's like a dam that's about to burst from the healing and the refreshing of God. Lead us, team. I want to pray. 